Hi, Mark. How are you? Good. Nice Good. to see you again. Good to see you. Lee has very good taste in where he lives, which is um, on my island, or I live on his island. I'm not quite sure how that works, uh, as well as Seattle. So um, good to see you. And um, full disclosure, Lee is also on the advisory board of Pattern Computer. We're probably going to do something together sometime pretty soon, I hope. And um, we've known each other for a long time. We have. Kind of interesting. So um, today we're going to talk about Lee's latest and best, newest and most interesting stuff, including uh, following your book. So um, I think for framing, w could you just kind of give the audience, we'll sell some books here today, give the audience, you know, the, the uh, three minute book, what is this book and why'd you write it? And then so we'll dive into it. The book I wrote with uh, a colleague, Nathan Price, is called The Art of Scientific Wellness. And it's really a book about the idea that data-driven health is going to be the biggest paradigm change in healthcare for the last 5,000 years. And the book talks about the history of how this came about. It discusses the idea of genomics and phenomics as being the driving force for doing this. The genome, as you know, is your source code for normal development. The phenome is a concept that covers things very broadly. So the phenome of an individual is how you appear at different stages of your development and what influences how you change as you develop are three things. Your genome, that basic source code, your behavior, your choices in exercise and diet and all of these things, and your environment. How do we assess these kinds of things? We look at the sequence of your genome. We look at your blood analytes. And let me just say a really important concept in this vision is the blood is a window into health and disease. It bathes all organs. They secrete molecules into the blood. And if you can quantify and identify the location source of those molecules, you can make inferences about the state of all of your internal organs and so forth. In addition, the gut microbiome is really a key aspect of things. And I would say in health, there are really three things we want to pay attention to in classic uh, health care pays attention to one, your brain health. And there are things you can quantitatively do both to assess and optimize your cognitive abilities. Your microbiome health, it's another creature that lives within you that influences enormously your diet, your, how you deal with drugs. It influences in striking ways how we age, uh, interestingly enough. And of course, your, your body health. And that's what we're attempting to do is to integrate all three of those types of health together. So why do I think the phenome adds such an enormous dimension, the blood analytes, the gut microbiome, the uh, digital health devices that uh, many of us use now? It's the integration of these things together that gives us the new kinds of insights. And we started a company in 2015 that lasted for four years on scientific wellness. We recruited 5,000 people who we analyzed every six months. So we had uh, four years worth of data on that data cloud for 5,000 people and I'll give you examples of some of the powerful uh, uh, sense we came to this really important idea. For most people, you are at probably 20% of your wellness, and we can optimize you enormously beyond that. So number one, we were able to take these six different types of data we put together and did statistical analyses of a data bit in one type with data bits and all other types. And we were able to show that there were of the order of 50,000 correlations. 
And you could scan through the correlations of these different data bits, and they took you to the literature and identified actionable possibilities that could either improve wellness or let you avoid disease. And by the time Aravail was over, we had about uh, 400 or so of these actionable possibilities. But a second thing we were able to do, because we had people from uh, 21 to 93, is we could actually analyze how people as they aged responded to the analysis of these blood analytes. And from that, we were able to develop an algorithm that allowed one to determine the biological age. The age your birthday says, not the age your birthday says you are, but rather the age your body says you are. And what was striking about this algorithm is we then went to the 5,000 individuals in this wellness program, and we showed for every year a woman was in the program, she lost a year and a half of biological age. And of course, the lower your biological age is relative to your chronologic age, the better your aging. Men lost 0.8 years. I had a friend who in that four year period lost 10 years of biological age. And from that calculation, I was about 15 years, uh, my biological age was 15 years below my chronologic age. So the really intriguing question for the first time is we have a metric we can use to assess wellness, if you will, and how far can we deter this whole aging process? And that's a question you can keep in mind. A second thing we uh, did with regard to the old aging process is we showed in the Airville population that almost 200 people transition from wellness to disease. We looked at 10 of these that had cancer, and for every single one, we were able to see enormously elevated proteins anywhere from two years to four years prior to clinical diagnosis. And the proteins were characteristic of the type of cancer and so forth. So the interesting possibility this raises is can we take that early diagnosis and reverse it? And for the case of cancer, one of the really exciting new possibilities is to use immunotherapy clean up the little mess when it's simple and get it done early, and you'll never see the disease. Now, there was a second actual uh, type of data that we were able to analyze, and that is we could take something called a polygenic score for a whole series of different common diseases. We ended up looking at 54 different ones. And because we had the whole genome, we could convert each individual in the 5,000 people into a genetic risk for that disease. And across the uh, x-axis, as the genetic risk increased, we could compare on the y-axis the phenotype for that disease and show that the upper 5 to 10 percent people in risk often had all of the metabolite abnormalities that those had already transitioned to disease had. So we could use this as a staging to say, here are five to 10% of the people we should be using with preventive kinds of therapies. And, and finally, I'll just say, we were able to analyze met metabolites and to get a biological BMI, biological mass index, far more accurate than the physical one that is typically used, and it gave us deep insights into new kinds of ways to deal with obesity and diabetes and these, all, these kinds of things. But the important point to make is integrating together these phenomics gives you metrics for assessing wellness, and the metrics give us the ability to optimize wellness through the actionable kinds of possibilities. Good answer. <laughs> uh, 
So as all, all y'all can tell, as my brother-in-law would say, um, Lee is a numbers guy. And um, I think in characterizing your whole career till now, um, the science that you bring, whether it's through tool, invention, or this kind of work, is, um, if not unique, really highly creative and qualified above and beyond almost anybody else I've ever met. And it's always inspiring for me to hear you do what you just did and, and quickly and cleanly lay out exactly what the program is and how um, um, computers and how data and how numbers uh, are deeply involved in understanding medicine in a way which, in my opinion, I wish had been done a long, long time ago. Um, so it, I mean, you always inspire me. Um, I like this, you know, we talked, I don't know if you were in the room, we were talking this morning about data-driven. I did. Yeah, and so, um, and, and Lee knows, Pattern's very interested in all this stuff. Um, it, it is, uh, a tr a, for me, it's a true thing that, that um, unfortunately, so much of medicine, even today, is standard of care, which I think just means you won't get sued very badly. And then, um, you know, maybe a little bit better is evidence-based, whatever the evidence might mean. Uh, but so far away still from what I think we would both call data-driven um, phenomics and, and, and clinical science. So um, when you look at this, uh, how much hope do you have that this vision you've got will see its way into the clinic? Uh, I'm 100% confident. I think the only <laughs> question is what's when? the timing? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I mean, it, it is inevitable. Look. The current healthcare system is absolutely unsustainable because it's focused on disease. And what does pharma do? It makes all of these wonderful, really highly targeted drugs. But you know what almost all of them do? They target symptoms. Mm -hmm. They don't target causes. You don't change late stage disease. You only deal with disease at the earliest stage and that's that's a lesson that I think people have to learn. And as I showed you, we have three or four really good ways of dealing with it for early disease. But what I'm, I'm quite optimistic about what AI can do for us. And I'll, I'll tell you, there are three centers in the world that are really taking what I call phenomics and blood analysis and all of these things. Uh, seriously. So the Weissman Institute in Israel, uh, a good friend of mine in Shanghai who's uh, actually president of the University of uh, Fudan, and, and the institute we have. Well, we have combined the two largest sets of phenomic data now uh, with Ron Siegel from Israel and our, our own data. And what we're planning to do is to use all of the tools of AI, finally taking the digital data of phenomics and converting it through knowledge graphs to language data so that it then can be fed into appropriately uh, educated uh, large language models. And, and we're collaborating with Google on one such model we're beginning to look at now. And I have the feeling we'll be able to take the enormous complexity of phenomic data and the large language models will in time be able to spit out for each individual a successive prioritized list of actionable possibilities which can then be delivered to a physician in a manner that both explains them and justifies them. And what that has the potential to do is make super physicians, because that will give the physician domain expertise in all the areas of medicine. And hence, he in partnership with the AI, and he'll have to make final judgments. We're not taking that away from any any physician at all, but they'll be able to treat their patients like no other physicians in the past could ever treat them. So I'm very optimistic about AI. And you know, I think, I think this kind of approach is really going to do four things. So I think one, 
it's going to let us deal with the five contemporary challenges of medicine, which are the quality, and the US quality of healthcare is pretty poor, I have to say, compared to the other 20 developed countries. The aging population, the emergence, explosive emergence of chronic diseases, uh, the whole question of racial diversity, and then finally cost. I think the data-driven approach that we've talked about here can, for example, lead to enormous cost savings by in a 10 or 15 year period. If we get rid of half of the chronic diseases, which I'm optimistic we could really think about being able to do, since today they, they acquire 86% of our $4.4 trillion budget, you can see the cost savings that are, are going to be there. I think the second point is we're going to replace a disease-oriented health care with a wellness and preventive-oriented health care. But I think what's really important for you as an individual is we're going to expand your health span into the 90s or even hundreds where you can be totally functional mentally and physically and you can have an extra 25 years of life. And the really important question is, what are you going to do with it? And I think golf and tennis aren't going to be a satisfactory answer for uh, that long a period of time. But I'll tell you, the big vision that comes from this that really excites me is the idea that we're pushing. We should have a second genome problem project called the Human Phenome Project where with government help, we take a million people over a 10-year period, we do a genome and phenome project, and what that will allow us to do are three important things. One, enormously validate the improved quality of data-driven health. Number two, show the striking cost savings that can be held. And number three, this is really important, advance the technology to a point where we can reduce enormously the dimensionality of data that we have to measure, in part by having digital devices that do things we've never thought about before. And I really see healthcare in the future of this type being done at home. You'll do your measurements at home and you'll send these things in that'll automatically get done. And that ends up saving enormous amount of, of cost and so forth. But I think the biggest challenge we face in all of this, and you know, I pushed some years ago the idea of P4 healthcare, predictive, preventive, personalized, and participatory. Well, the first three Ps, prediction, prevention, personalization, they're all about science. The fourth P, participation, is all about psychology and sociology and economics and all of these. How do you persuade patients, physicians, healthcare leaders, healthcare industry leaders, regulators, politicians, how do you persuade people to change one system, disease-oriented, for another wellness and prevention-oriented and in the end, I think the really key answer is going to be economics, that you can do so much saving that these people, in spite of the fact no one wants to change, they will change because that's where they have to go to make the money. Let me ask you a, a slightly tangential question, which I know you know the answer to. There is a cynical view of the current system and the insurance companies involved in the system and big farm and all, where they want you to be sick economically. The idea of taking those people off of the uh, treadmill of chronic disease would mean trillions of dollars they didn't harvest. Absolutely. Um, just throwing that out there. So um, is that the adversary? Well, let me tell you how we're approaching that problem. And that is an enormous problem. So we're now negotiating with a big healthcare system 
which has three really unusual characteristics. I can't say it because we're not quite done yet, but one, the CEO is a visionary and he wants to do where he wants to go where medicine is going. Uh, number two, it's an integrated payer provider system. Yeah. And the key there is the money initially goes to the payer, but if they're integrated together, the provider also benefits. And it's going to drive effective systems to integrate payers and pro you know, providers alone are a third man that doesn't need to be there unless they integrate in with payers. That's my uh, point of view. And, and the third thing they have that's really unusual is a benefactor that's given them more than a billion dollars over 10 years in a hundred million dollar aliquots to invent the future of medicine. So we're going to invent the future of phenomics with this hospital system. And I think we'll be in an ideal position to show the power of what this can do and force other systems to begin rethinking how they think about economics. So good answer for that question. And a related question would be what you touched on a briefly a minute ago. Um, imagine that you're a future patient customer and um, you uh, have breakfast at McDonald's every day and then you take a taxi cab to the other McDonald's for lunch and then at nighttime you have McDonald's for dinner. And lo and behold, after a while, I'm going to throw a little joke in here. Are, are you aware that the, this could be wrong, guys, that the CEOs of um, a very famous hamburger company have all died of heart attacks? Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> not surprised, although I am surprised they eat their own product. They, they go to their own thing all day long. And yeah, it's, it's part of a benefits program for being the CEO of one. Well, of well, I'll tell you, if you have that phenotype, we can still deal with you with these new anti-weight drugs that have an oh. enormous capacity for diminishing weight. I'm wondering if there's a, you mentioned psychology and sociology. I wonder if there is some visual thing or a set of tools that are more accessible generally to people that would be convincing to them and exciting to them, not just like do this because I told you to do it, but really encourage them to reduce their biological age or, or their health state. Yeah. Prove it. So I'll tell you one of the things I've seen that's been most effectively in recruiting people into these kind of programs is to induce them. I mean, look, it, when you go most places in America, everyone is either from 10 pounds to 80 pounds overweight. And the best thing they could do for their health is lose that weight. And I'll tell you, intermittent fasting allows you to do that in a way that's efficient and you, you without any of these chemicals mm. that can also do these kind of things. Chemicals have one really bad side effect I'll tell you about in just a moment. So I think with, if you can get them to start losing their weight and look, once you take 40 pounds off, you feel differently. You have enormous energy. You, and plus all the other things that we can do for you. I think, I mean, myself, I think the, the most important things I do are one, exercise, so I can still do 150 push-ups every morning and 100 sit-ups and deep, I, I, I exercise for 40 minutes or so, and that really sets me up for the rest of the day. I think. The second thing is you, you can optimize your diets. You, you know, one of the interesting things about data-driven health is it really transforms classical health, you know, weight, exercise, diet, stress, those kinds, because it tells you individually how you can optimize each of those kind of things in really quite striking and effective ways. So, uh, so I, we found in Aerofail, the company failed not because, I think Aerofail is the most important company I ever did, even though it failed. It failed financially for reasonable reasons, and the worst one was we didn't have physicians associated, so we couldn't give them disease-related actionable possibilities, and we had hundreds of those, which we gave to them, and they took to their doctors, and you know, doctors fell in three classes. There were 
the set that were enthusiastic endorsed it. They worked with us. There was a totally indifferent set. And then there were the hostile, aggressive, angry, defensive doctors. And I'm glad to say that a lot of the patients in Aravel left those doctors mm -hmm. and got appropriate kind of doctors. So anyway, I think, I think with the proper education, and it should start in high school. We've just done actually a, a, a four-segment year-long course on systems medicine with all of these kinds of things in the course. And those kids are going to know more about the future of medicine than 98% of the doctors out there when they come out. So and we have three point whatever. So um, when you look forward, let's say you look forward 10 years, because enough time, and, and you're picturing that all these things rolled out properly and um, Eureka, um, tell us, paint that picture, paint that vision of, of wellness care at that time. How, how much different is it from today and uh, how excited should we be about this happening, coming true? So I think in, in, in 10 years, how far it's spread, I don't know, but there'll be major systems that will be using it. And the way it's different from today is you'll, one way or another, have digital devices that will measure and record and, and, and make data available on physiology. And you'll have um, uh, blood drawing and microbiome. Those are, the, those are the three big types of data that we'll really want to have available for everybody. And we can make them simpler and cheaper and easier, especially if we get this second genome type project where, you know, the first genome project drove the cost of the first genome down. That cost $3 billion to do. Today, you can do a genome for 100. So that's seven orders of magnitude reduced in price. And with phenomics, we're going to see the same kind of change. And, and the introduction of new technologies that will make it easier to make all the vital measurements that give us your biological age and your, your BMI and all of these other things. If you can't measure it, you can improve it. That's really key. And the measurements I talked about are all the integration of enormous amounts of data that come from all different parts of your body to give you a global assessment of biological age or, or BMI. Sounds pretty goodly. Um, well, I'm, I have a sign-up list for those who are in <laughs> Sign up. Uh, we have one minute. So we have one question. The first person to jump, you have to jump fast and go to a, a microphone, and we'll take your question. Mia Champion. <clears throat> All right, thank you. It's always a privilege to hear you uh, speak about your research. So um, I have a couple, two-part, really quick. Um, you mentioned the genome. Does that also include the transcriptome, the metabolome? No, those are all the phenome. OK. OK. okay. But the phenome includes those things. OK. OK. Perfect. And then um, because you're Met, you know, assessing things like behavior and in the, in the environment, which can be very volatile. You know, using Mark's example, if that person decided to just eat hamburgers for a week and then came to you, and that was the starting measurement you started with, that may actually not be sort of their ground state or their normal behavior. Is it challenging for you to sort of assess what is this person's kind of ground state, um, and I feel like that would take some time to kind of see, you know, to be able to assess that. Can you talk about maybe how that might be challenging or how you Well, the way that? we're doing, I mean, there are two kinds of assessment you can make. For blood and microbiome, we do that twice a year, okay? The, the digital health, we have continuous readouts on those kind of things. So we, we can get an instantaneous assessment of activity and quality of sleep and all of those uh, different kinds of things. But on the, the, those analyses we have to do with blood and the microbiome, they take a little longer to, but at the end of a year, you're 
in pretty good shape and you'll know where it is. A really interesting related question is, when should I begin doing this? And I think the answer is, you can start any time and really improve your wellness. It's likely if you start earlier, you'll benefit later in life and deal more effectively with that extended health span out to uh, into the 90s or 100s. And, you know, the, the key part of that is community. What is utterly critical for a health span into the 90s and 100s is to have acquired friends around you as you go all the way along uh, to replace those of your relatives and friends that die off. And this may sound trivial to the younger people. It isn't trivial to us older people. And, and the vitality of interaction with other humans is absolutely critical. Thank you, Lee. And now it's time to go eat healthy food, folks. <laughs>